really an absolute honor. It is probably the greatest honor of my career to date to come back here to Stanford. Um, this is really our home uh, and was our home for nearly a decade when uh, my wife Lourdes and I uh, were here and uh, really truly the launching point uh, for our lives and, and my career. So uh, I've given invited lectures um, all around the country and around the world, but this one is very, very different for me. And I hope I can share with you and impart to you why it was so unique and so special to be here at Stanford and why for the, the candidates, the applicants who are, are here uh, to interview at, at Stanford, why this is really such a special place. So with that, um, let's get started. Um, I have nothing to disclose other than that I am the son of immigrants who came to the United States uh, with the dream of a better life for the family. And that I have always aspired in everything that I do to ultimately someday be able to make some sort of an impact. And very importantly, I did not make this trip alone. Nobody can make this sort of a trip alone and I definitely didn't either. So what I thought I would do was to break up my talk sort of temporally into different phases of my life so that you could understand contextually how Stanford fits into all of this. And there was certainly a before Stanford period where I think I'll talk briefly about uh, the origins of my family and how I became who I was as I entered into Stanford, the Stanford years. And in context of that, uh, I'll talk briefly about uh, some of the Stanford surgery legacy as well. And then our lives uh, after Stanford and how I have developed as an academic pediatric surgeon. And then at the end, a little bit of life lessons, sort of uh, some thought that I've given to this. And uh, this is one of Rod Rodin's uh, sculpture pieces that sits here in the sculpture garden on campus. So for those who are interested in uh, art, uh, there's definitely tons of it here to be able to partake. So uh, before Stanford. So with regards to my family, I think it's important contextually to understand where they came from, which is the island of Taiwan, which is about 100 miles off the uh, mainland coast of China. Uh, and uh, uh, it has a population of about 24 million, about the size of Delaware. Um, it was settled through the Austronesian migration through the South Pacific Islands back uh, 6,000 years ago originally, uh, but in recent centuries uh, was colonized uh, multiple uh, occasions by uh, foreign countries and returned to the Republic of China in 1945 uh, uh, with the rise of Chairman Mao Zedong, uh, who basically was purging the Republic of China. Uh, the leadership uh, escaped to Taiwan and, and basically took over the island and has proclaimed uh, its independence from the People's Republic of China uh, ever since. And as such, um, uh, you know, there has been uh, the recent contentiousness that you probably have read about between the United States and China with regards to the independence of uh, Taiwan. Um, that has always been in the context behind the scenes for my family. As mentioned, my family's been in Taiwan for multiple generations. And in uh, the 1950s on, uh, education was sort of realized as the key to being able to rise through uh, society, rise up through one's uh, 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 sort of niche in, in, in society. And included in all of that were girls. So girls were uh, um, uh, em emphasized in sort of participation in education. My parents met at the National Taiwan University, which is the top uh, university in uh, the country. And there, and these are photos of my mom and my dad, and there they talked about the future and planning for family and where to go. And they thought it was the right thing to go to the United States, but it wasn't so easy back then. And for nearly a century, um, Asians were excluded from being able to uh, readily uh, immigrate into the United States. Uh, um, and there was in fact, a, the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, this was partially repealed in 1943, but quotas main, were maintained thereafter. Uh, but in 1965, the Immigration and Naturalization Act 
uh, allowed for um, immigrants with special skills to be able to come to the United States. And therein, um, our parents, my parents, uh, saw an opportunity to come to the United States uh, as graduate students to the University of Nebraska. Uh, my dad in electrical engineering and my mom uh, in the Department of History. And within a year, they had me. They married and they had me. Um, and uh, uh, that's how we got started as a, a, a family. Through the years, they uh, had three other kids, my, uh, my uh, three other siblings, and they worked extraordinarily hard to sacrifice and provide for my, my siblings and me. And I led a near idyllic life because of the sacrifices that my parents made. But while my life was pretty good, my sister, Shirley, uh, struggled. She was born with Apert syndrome and uh, uh, basically had to undergo, uh, because of craniosynostosis, multiple operations uh, to really try, uh, one, to, to survive, and then two, to be functional. Um, but because she looked different, she, she led a life of uh, ridicule and marginalization uh, by others who did not accept her because she looked different. Uh, and this was really, really tough for her. And, in, and into adulthood, this has continued. And in spite of all of that, she has uh, maintained herself as a good soul. She's an incredibly caring and giving individual and really a role model and an inspiration to me and has been throughout my life. I don't often say it, but that is definitely the case. So with that, through high school, I went off to college and I learned a lot of things and I, and I had a, a, a number of great opportunities, but the biggest was the opportunity to meet my wife, Lodez. Uh, we started dating in college and married in medical school in Baltimore um, and uh, spent uh, uh, essentially nine wonderful years there in Baltimore uh, 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 pre-Stanford. And with that, I developed an interest in general surgery and somewhat of an interest in pediatric surgery, but I was really an open book. I was an un undifferentiated stem cell, as it were. And so, um, you know, those initial years, without any question, were the product of the sacrifice, sacrifices that my parents made for me to have the opportunities here in the United States. Extraordinarily grateful to them. I will forever be grateful to them for what they've done for me. So uh, I matched at Stanford uh, for general surgery. And uh, I think contextually, before I talk about uh, our years here, I think it's important to talk about the legacy of Stanford and what it really has been through uh, the generations. And you have to start with uh, the first chair of the Department of Surgery, Emil Holman. Um, who was a Stanford undergrad, a Rhodes Scholar, uh, and he went to medical school at Hopkins. All right, sorry about that. Um, so John Niederhuber, who was the chair of surgery here, who recruited me and a number of others uh, uh, to uh, start our surgical careers. And he was uh, in charge for five years. After his uh, um, uh, uh, departure, he went on to become the director of the National Cancer Institute uh, for another five years and really um, had a, an extraordinary, uh, still has an extraordinarily productive academic career publishing in uh, absurdly impactful uh, journals, not just in cancer, which is what he was known for, but really in um, pediatric phenogenomics as well. And uh, it's, uh, I would love to catch up with him and and uh, get in his ear and understand why and how he actually got into that, but he's actually evolved into different directions and done wonderfully from a scholarship perspective. Um, and that's really what he brought to Stanford. The, you know, prior to that, Stanford was uh, very well known for cardiac, cardiothoracic surgery. General surgery was a strong clinical uh, training program here, but it really wasn't the sort of the, the highlight of Stanford surgery. And so he brought faculty in. He recruited trainees of like mind with him uh, who wanted to make an impact in academic surgery, and, and uh, I followed him. So uh, it was, uh, uh, that, that was the beginning. Um, a few years later, Tom Crummel uh, assumed the chair here um, and uh, served as the chair of surgery uh, for 16 years, 16 amazing years um, 
wherein also as the uh, surgeon in chief at Packard, he really was transformative in his thought and was involved in uh, the formation of BioX, which is sort of the merging of the, the minds of the uh, department of uh, the School of Medicine and the School of Engineering here at Stanford, uh, which is uh, arguably one of the top if, uh, in the country, if not in the world, uh, for engineering, uh, and uh, was integral in the biodesign program uh, to get trainees to come in and think across these disciplines that are seemingly disparate, but not really, and important to merge together. And during his uh, leadership, there was, uh, without question, the most significant growth of the Department of Surgery uh, in terms of academics, in terms of the number of faculty, in terms of the, 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 the training program, uh, which, has, uh, which elevated in terms of its uh, national stature. Um, and in 2000, um, he uh, initiated the inaugural uh, Emil Holman uh, lectureship and invited Halstead Homan, uh, Emil Homan's son, to come and give that original lecture. And I was uh, fortunate to be here at that time uh, to partake in that, uh, that talk. Uh, and now, um, uh, Mary Hahn uh, has been the chair here for now seven years. Uh, and really, uh, as the Emil Homan Chair of Surgery has really taken this to the next level, she has held uh, numerous uh, leadership positions uh, in societies, uh, surgical societies around uh, the country, but the biggest one that she currently holds now is the chair of the American Board of Surgery. That is the certifying body for the House of Surgery. And so you someday will sit for your boards. Um, it's, that is the product of Dr. Dr. Hahn's uh, uh, committee and team. And during this uh, seven year period, uh, the Department of Surgery has continued to thrive. Uh, I've had the gr great fortune of being able to watch and observe from outside with um, inside uh, Intel as well uh, to learn about the, the wonderful things that have been going on in this, this department. And without question, this is one of the most vibrant, if not the most vibrant department of surgery in the country for um, it, its diversity, its empowerment of its faculty and its trainees and you know, the continued ongoing academic and clinical successes of the department. But that's not all of the Sanford surgery legacy. And what I can tell you is that there have been a number of notable faculty uh, that have come uh, through surgery here. Norm Shumway, uh, arguably the father of uh, cardiac transplant, uh, uh, practiced here and was really uh, the, the mover and shaker of cardiac surgery. Tom Fogarty, uh, uh, one of the uh, most uh, preeminent uh, surgical innovators was on faculty here for a number of years. Mike Longacre, who is currently still here and a big, huge reason why many of you, you uh, potential candidates to Stanford should consider coming here. He has the golden touch. Basically, you go into his lab, um, you will be successful in whatever area of uh, uh, surgery you choose to go into. And even though he is a focused uh, plastic surgeon, his research projects, his program uh, is uh, much more broadly uh, encompassing uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, biology of regenerative medicine and, and uh, uh, repair and regeneration. Jeff Lee, uh, the first uh, distinguished lecturer, as I understand, uh, for uh, the series uh, is the uh, vice chair of uh, academic affairs at MD Anderson and the chair of surgical oncology there. Uh, Daniela Laudner, uh, one of uh, another of the Stanford alumni uh, is the uh, Chief of Transplant Surgery at Northwestern and an RL1 extramurally funded uh, uh, surgeon scientist. And then there's George Yang, uh, who was my friend and colleague. We were contemporaries here at Stanford. He recently passed away this July, uh, but uh, I would say in so many different ways um, had an extraordinary career of impact. Um, one that I think we could only hope to strive for and I remember very, very vividly in the trenches, on call, in-house here at Stanford as surgery residents, talking with him about a gazillion different subjects. And one evening we were talking about the bamboo ceiling. And I said, what the heck is the bamboo ceiling? And very much like the glass ceiling that has existed so, for so many, um, the, there is a bamboo ceiling. And while Asians can get into medicine, Asians can get into surgery, Asians struggle to move up 
into positions of leadership, and it's a multifactorial uh, reason as to why that is. And you know, in that moment, talking to George, I said, yeah, I, I guess this is true, this is real, but there's nothing you can do about this. This is just one of the realities of our, our lives in, in surgery. Well, George didn't just say, there's nothing to do about this. George did something about this. He founded the Society of Asian Academic Surgeons, and importantly, he founded it not for himself, but rather, as it says here um, in this uh, mission statement, to increase Asian representation in leadership of academic surgery to prepare future generations to succeed. He didn't found SAS for himself. He founded it for others so that they wouldn't have to go through the things that we might have to go through right now. George passed away, but in his legacy, the Society of Asian Academic Surgeons is thriving. It is one of the most rapidly growing organizations. It is putting uh, folks into different positions of leadership within the house of surgery and uh, uh, succeeding and thriving in ways that George could only have imagined. And certainly I couldn't um, talking to him in that original conversation. So, uh, you know, an amazing individual without question. Other notable uh, Stanford surgery alumni include John Langell, who is a president of a medical school, Deb Desai, chief of uh, pediatric transplant, Randy Green, chief of cardiac surgery, Yvonne Karanis, chief of surgery at Santa Clara Valley, Maureen Tedesco, chief of surgery at Kaiser Santa Clara, Tom Wynn, who is a chief of cardiothoracic surgery at UCSF. And this is just a small handful. I could spend hours just talking about this because I've actually Googled it and researched it and it's pretty darn impressive where some of the fact the notable alumni have gone on to. So with that context, I can now sort of bring myself back into this. And in the early years, the first few years of Stanford surgery, it was crazy, it was fun. There was no 80 hour work week, we just worked. Um, it wasn't necessarily a good thing, but that's just what we did. Um, and uh, you know, that is where I started to foster an, a, a passion and uh, interest in pediatric surgery. Uh, Lourdes and I had our first child, Brian, uh, and uh, he commonly, as you can see there on the far right, had to come visit me because I was in the hospital and I couldn't come home to visit him. And, you know, things were really going great. I developed this interest, like I said, in pediatric surgery and uh, uh, entered a research lab with Augusto Bastidas with an NRSA uh, fellowship award and published a, a number of uh, basic science papers. I published a number of clinical papers with Eric Skarsgård, uh, who was one of the, he was actually the only pediatric surgeon uh, for a long time here at CHLA and, and uh, eventually there were others. And he's now the uh, surgeon in chief at Vancouver Children's Hospital in British Columbia. And really that was, you know, things were rolling along and things were good. I was uh, uh, developing, gaining some momentum and uh, uh, towards a career in pediatric surgery. And in 1999, um, uh, everything was fine. We had our son, I had my interests, I had a plan, we had things just lining up for us to move forward. Then everything fell apart and uh, Lourdes was diagnosed with chronic myelogenous leukemia and had to put a fast stop on everything. Uh, and that is not the easiest thing to do uh, under any circumstances, but when you have a plan and you want to follow it, you basically have to um, change directions and, uh, and, and, and stop and reassess things. And that's basically what we did. And so I sort of said goodbye to, uh, you know, the plans for pediatric surgery and thought, you know, whatever it takes, uh, it's, it's the family number one, career number two. And it, that's really how it ought to be, truly, honestly. And so uh, we took a pause. And we had a lot of discussion about our options uh, back then. And even now, bone marrow transplant is a highly effective but high mortality risk option for patients that have leukemia. And there were other options as well, but this was really the home run to go for if you, if you want. And so as basically 30-year-olds, we thought we needed to hit the home run. And so um, uh, we conferred with the... Uh, Transplant patient, the transplantation unit here uh, at Stanford, 
we decided that we needed to bank a bunch of frozen embryos, and we did. We froze 19 frozen embryos away across the street um, and uh, geared up, uh, getting ready for chemotherapy and the transplant. And so this is a, a photo that was taken right before uh, we uh, went in. Lourdes got her hair cut uh, because she knew that uh, the hair was coming out and uh, it would be easier if the hair was shorter. And uh, then uh, another disaster hit, uh, and I learned that my health insurance uh, was no longer valid. And so my Stanford acquired health insurance would not cover me going forward. And this was the worst case scenario. How on earth do you pay for a several hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of treatment um, as a surgery resident, right? And so, um, goodbye health insurance and, and not really sure what we were going to do. And it was at this moment that my chair, Tom Cummel, stepped up and said, Casper, I got this. Don't worry about the health insurance. I'll take care of it. You go be with Lourdes. I'll take care of this. And he did. Never had to think about coverage ever again. Um, thereafter, uh, things just started to uh, fit into place. We went in Lourdes went in for her myeloblative chemotherapy and her transplant and was in isolation uh, on E3 in the bottom right there for a month. Um, it was not an easy time. Uh, Brian did not feel comfortable masking up and wearing a gown. So oftentimes uh, they interacted uh, only through the glass window. Uh, and this was a really, really rough time for us, but uh, family and very, very importantly, friends came to help us uh, through this difficult period and faculty, very importantly, faculty as well. And so it was during this time that George and a number of the surgery residents there and their spouses stepped up uh, to, to, to sort of give us a break. And so while I was visiting with Lourdes along with several of Lourdes's family, um, they would take Brian and just take care of him all day. And all day meant all day from eight in the morning uh, till 10 at night. And then I'd go and pick him up and bring him home and he would sleep in the bed with me. And this, is, this was the routine for well over a month until Lourdes was able to come out of isolation and Brian was able to come and visit and uh, be hugged and be held by her. And it was just an amazing uh, experience to watch her come back out of this all. And through this, I would say um, we became closer and we became stronger. And, um, thereafter, eventually Lourdes was diagnosed without evidence of disease. A couple years later, we decided to thaw one of those uh, straws of frozen embryos, and uh, the result was Emily, our, our second child. And uh, um, she likes to think she's a lot older and more mature than she really is uh, because of those two extra years. Uh, and we give her that, uh, but uh, then, we, then we have to knock her down a peg or two here and there. But um, suffice it to say that this was an extraordinarily challenging period in our lives. But eventually, uh, I was able to come back. I took a six-month leave of absence from my surgery residency, came back uh, gingerly, uh, but uh, was able to sort of re-engage with my surgical training and reignite my passion and interest in pediatric surgery. And after much discussion with Lourdes, about the pros and cons, whether it was uh, safe to proceed or not, I decided to go ahead and apply for the match and uh, uh, with great fortune was able to match uh, at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and game was back on. So with that, uh, you know, uh, I can say without question that what Stanford provided for us was the opportunity uh, to take a pause, take care of ourselves because health and family are by far more important than anything else that you can ever think about and uh, allow us to uh, recover a little bit. After Stanford, um, uh, as I mentioned, I, we moved to Los Angeles and I did my pediatric surgery fellowship training at Stanford. And this is a photo uh, in my chief year there with uh, Dr. Mahor, who uh, practiced into his late 70s. Uh, and I learned a ton from him and the faculty there. Uh, but it was really truly my experiences at Stanford that enabled me uh, to become the pediatric surgery, surgeon that I am. And, 
You can see here some representative images of uh, stuff that I've been able to do. Uh, as a pediatric surgeon, I've practiced the full breadth of, uh, of pediatric surgery with some surgical oncology, uh, management and care of uh, congenital malformations and trauma. Um, and really, uh, as a consequence of this, in this, uh, uh, what has been a very wonderful uh, and fruitful career, I've, I've taken care of so many patients that I've been able to watch grow up. And in the upper middle there, you can see uh, one of my former patients who a number of years later called me and said, you know, I have this terrible dilemma and I need your advice. And I was like, okay, this, this has to be something awful in medical. And it was basically, she said, I got into two, uh, two colleges and I don't know which one to go to. I got into Johns Hopkins and Duke. And I know you went to Hopkins, what do you think? And I was like, you don't really have a problem. That is a problem everybody wishes that they had. He went on to medical school and is, is thriving and uh, touches base with me periodically. And it is just an incredible feeling when she does to know that uh, I've had uh, the opportunity to really impact her and, and uh, set her on her life. And that's, it's a wonderful thing. Without question, this doesn't happen without my experiences here at Stanford. Because of my experiences at Stanford with uh, basic research, basic science research, I really wanted that to be part of my life and my career. I am naturally an inquisitive person. I ask questions and then I wanna find out the why. And, and so basic science really uh, fits for me. And uh, uh, you know, I have focused my academic interests uh, on congenital liver diseases, liver fibrosis, um, and uh, the biggest of all of the diseases is biliary atresia, which continues to plague us because even if we do a perfect operation and we get bile to drain in these infants, um, uh, almost all of them go on to liver fibrosis, uh, end stage liver failure and cirrhosis and require a liver transplant or they die. And so in spite of our best efforts, we are still terrible at taking care of these patients. And so I've spent a lot of time uh, studying biliary atresia. I focused my energies on a protein that's expressed by stem cells and progenitor cells. Um, I've uh, had the amazing, great fortune to work with some trainees that are just so extraordinarily motivated for their own careers and their own interests to, to pursue uh, some of these answers. And I've collaborated with amazing folks through the years to really try and understand uh, why these uh, hepatic progenitor cells might play a role in liver fibrosis. They, they emerge, the expression of these cells, these, the numbers of these cells uh, increase very significantly in regions of evolving fibrosis. And that can't be a coincidence. And so we've gone on to study and Jessica Zagri, who is the lead author here and now faculty uh, at the Louisiana State University was really integral in sort of moving our science forward looking at knockouts and really just proving functionally that prominent one is involved in liver fibrosis. And, you know, I'm not going into the nitty gritty details of any of this because that's not the point of this, uh, this talk, but suffice it to say, this has spurred on subsequent trainees to ask the next set of questions. And it has been extremely fun to help them ask those questions. Mike Fenlon, uh, extended the work and is now a liver transplant fellow at Georgetown. And uh, Celia Short uh, uh, took some of his data and then explored it further uh, to uh, really identify a signaling pathway that is really integral in animal models and then used a huge database uh, through the Childhood Liver Disease Re Research Network to be able to show that this is a clinically significantly uh, relevant signaling pathway for liver fibrosis. Uh, and then Alan Zong, who uh, just recently also finished in the lab, uh, looked at the prominent one expression along the extra hepatic bile duct uh, and has shown that these, uh, that these uh, progenitor cells actually give rise to cholangiocytes that sort of reconstitute and repair the extra hepatic biliary tree following injury um, and uh, has really shown uh, some interesting data to suggest that uh, uh, PROM1 uh, is a ciliopathy gene and null uh, and, and missense mutations, in fact, in PROM1 uh, have been associated with biliary atresia uh, in large part, uh, we think, due to the loss of uh, cilia, uh, functional, uh, the, the functionality of uh, these epithelial progenitor cells 
being lost as a consequence of this and uh, really have sort of set up my academic career going forward. Uh, without any of these trainees, I can't be the, um, in this position scientifically. It's been absolutely a pleasure. And those of you who have, uh, who have mentored uh, trainees that had zero experience with research and watched them grow and develop and become scientists, fully functional scientists know the, the, the enormous pleasure that one gets, the gratification that one gets in watching your mentees become something that they weren't before. So uh, extending beyond that in clinic, uh, clinically is teaching and mentoring uh, the next generation of pediatric surgeons. And so in my position, I've been very, very, very fortunate to be uh, involved in the training of some very, very remarkable people who have gone on to do some great things and are, are practicing pediatric surgery or other things uh, around the country. Um, part of uh, academic surgery is uh, trying to figure out if you want to be engaged in leadership. And uh, when you're a surgeon, you are a leader in the operating room. Um, you have to lead in the operating room in order for the operation to run smoothly. But you can also engage uh, at the institutional level um, in a variety of tracks or nationally um, or internationally for that matter. And uh, I've uh, been fortunate enough to be in organizations, to be mentored and ad advocated for, uh, to uh, be able to participate in uh, a number of uh, uh, leadership uh, organizations and committees uh, to make impact, which is really ultimately what this is all about. Uh, and as the uh, uh, president of the Society of University Surgeons last year, uh, my platform was uh, expanding the pipeline for underrepresented minorities. And this is an extension of some of George's work and an extension of simply just watching and observing our colleagues and friends and recognizing that we have a gap. We have a gap in health equity. We have a gap in uh, uh, inclusivity and equity within, uh, within uh, academics and surgery is not without that. So um, um, I, capped, uh, I capped my year off with my presidential ad address at the Academic Surgical Congress. One of our initiatives uh, that uh, um, uh, is about to come online and, and has taken some time and I'm really, really proud of this one is our relationship with the American Association for the Advancement of Science and their department of uh, 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 inclusive STEM ecosystems for equity and diversity. And what this uh, department within the AAAS has done through the years is to actually um, target uh, undergraduate students who are interested in STEM and really try and provide them with opportunities to pursue this. And so um, I reached out to their leadership and said, we want to partner. And so as, uh, as, as it turns out, they had a number of internships uh, in engineering. They have uh, in LA County, they have a Department of Sanitation internship to, for those that might want to learn about sanitation engineering and, and uh, you know, uh, climate uh, uh, ecology um, uh, is another internship. And we offered up as Society of University Surgeons an undergraduate summer biomedical research internship, which um, would take um, uh, funding from the Society of University Surgeons, uh, but can be expanded to other organizations and administered and execute, uh, executed by the AAAS, which has the infrastructure uh, to reach out to undergraduate students um, of tremendous potential um, uh, to provide these internships for the summer um, with SUS numbers and institutions. So there are a number of SUS members within uh, the Department of Surgery. I would think Stanford would be a perfect place to foster and support one of these interns. The RFA is coming out right now for the summer of 2023. And we'll see how this goes, but this is our effort to sort of lead by example and show that we have something to offer, that we can uh, provide a little bit of a boost and help uh, some undergraduate students uh, of, uh, that might not have all of the benefits that perhaps you could even argue maybe I had because my family focused and emphasized education throughout my childhood. Um, we talked at length uh, I talked at length uh, at uh, during my presidential address about the pipeline 
how important it is to load the pipeline and how important it is to address the leakiness of it. Uh, you can see a number of the initiatives there in the top right that we, the Society of University Surgeons, have chosen to participate in or initiate, uh, leading by example, as it were, and a number of the additional uh, initiatives, including this internship, that uh, are in evolution currently through the efforts of the Society of University Surgeons. As past president, I have had the great fortune to be able to continue to participate in this and watch our uh, issues committee develop this program. Uh, and I give them pointers and some guidance as to how I think this might work. And so we're just about ready. Look for this emailer coming out uh, very, very soon. We need your help. Um, and so um, I summarized my address by talking about how important diversity and inclusion is for health equity. Uh, how it is important to be aware of the leaky pipeline. And I don't, I don't have time to go into this, uh, but it is imp an important uh, topic to, uh, an issue to understand. And if you wanna hear more about it, there's a, a QR code there in the top left uh, that links to my talk, if you wish, that it's not enough to just have the talent and the skill set to be able to do this. You need mentors, absolutely positively need mentorship attain the goals that you might want to have in high, uh, high aspirations. And that um, there is an important, uh, that it is important to emphasize uh, 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 URM in surgical leadership. You need uh, our leadership to look like our society, period. So, um, you know, this has led to other talks that I've been asked to give, and this is one that I gave this summer uh, on key metrics of health equity. And uh, as defined by the CDC, uh, health equity is uh, achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full, full health potential, and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. Hard to fix something if you don't know how to quantify it. So they asked me to talk about how to quantify it. Um, and uh, I had uh, the, uh, the podium, I shared the podium with these amazing, amazing individuals. My two cents worth on this topic. Also had a little bit of an odd legacy, uh, as it were, as a Stanford alum. I was asked uh, by the LA Zoo uh, to take care of this marmoset monkey who had gallstones and the vet was very uncomfortable tackling this. So I took one of my partners, we took some loops, we snuck away some surgical instruments from the operating room at CHLA and we went over to the LA Zoo to take care of this monkey named Mona and she did wonderfully. I also was asked, I was actually voluntold uh, to go and speak to the writers of Grey's Anatomy and I thought I, that would be an easy thing to just talk about some of the pediatric surgery cases that uh, I had been involved in through the years. And I had a room of about 20 writers that were just sitting there taking notes and they were yawning, a couple were falling asleep. And I just thought, well, this isn't really pediatric surgery, but when I was a Stanford surgery resident, I took care of an 80 year old patient who had a ruptured AAA at the VA and I did a thoracotomy in the ED. And Von Dahlman is here. Uh, he was the faculty uh, who was involved in that case with me and that patient survived. And I thought, all right, this is awesome. They're gonna, they're gonna write this up. They were just going crazy, writing all kinds of notes and they were asking me follow-up questions. And I thought this is gonna be the most amazing storyline of Grey's Anatomy ever. And so my wife recorded it because of course I couldn't watch it live. And uh, lo and behold, they totally destroyed my story they, they changed it, they, they changed it such that I did the ED thoracotomy with the blade of a clipboard on the psychiatry ward. Ron, I don't think you would have allowed me to do that. I'm pretty sure you wouldn't have allowed me to do that. Anyway, uh, suffice to say, they, they kept asking me to come back and give more stories that I declined because I didn't want to be part of that anymore. But uh, one of the cooler things was uh, I was portrayed by this, this actor and this is a significant upgrade in looks without question. So um, you don't get where, you're, uh, where I've gotten to without mentors and advisors. 
that have really guided me through my career. And you can see here several from Stanford who had made a huge difference for me. Dr. O, Augusto Bastidas, who is now practicing down in San Jose. Eric Skarsgård, I mentioned, who was a pediatric surgeon, practicing essentially 24-7, 365 by himself uh, at Packard for a number of years. Tom Crummel goes without saying, I, we owe him so much. Um, but beyond that, you know, I've had the great fortune of having amazing mentors and advisors. This is only a small handful of them. Katherine Anderson, who uh, was uh, really one of the trailblazers for women in surgery, who had to experience enormous amounts of discrimination, harassment, bias throughout her career to really make it ultimately to become president of the American College of Surgeons after a very long, illustrious career uh, in academic pediatric surgery. Henri Ford, uh, who was my boss at Children's Hospital Los Angeles for 15 years uh, before moving on to become the dean of the University of Miami Medical School, um, is an extremely close friend, confidant, and an advisor. Um, he is also now the president-elect of the American College of Surgeons. So if you're affiliated with me, you might get to be president someday. And then Herb Chen, who is really uh, just an amazing individual. Who, he's the chair of surgery uh, at UAB. Um, this is not an advertisement for UAB surgery, but he's also an amazing chair of surgery uh, akin to, to Mary and uh, uh, in a department who is, that's also thriving. He has been uh, a, a guide for me as well. Countless others, Mike, uh, George. Uh, you know, I can still hear George's voice in my head what to do and what not to do sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't make this trip alone. That's, I think, the, the message that I'd probably like to give with you. But above all, everybody in my life, I would not be here standing before you as a distinguished alumnus if it were not for my wife. And the things that we've gone through uh, together, survived together, our family that we've uh, raised together and the career that I've had, it does not happen without you. So the lessons that I've learned, health is fleeting, life is precious, don't waste it. Find your impact and fight for it. You cannot do this alone. You need your family, you need your friends, you need your mentors. Stay humble because surgery has a way of knocking you down. Life has a way of knocking you down and pay it forward. The next generation needs to be better than you. The role that Stanford surgery has played in my life is I think pretty obvious. I think I liken myself to a stem cell, basically, that needed nurturing my wife, my family, and me. And Stanford provided me the stroma, the substrate, the cells that supported me uh, to become and differentiate into uh, the, the final uh, 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 phenotype that I am. Uh, it has given me enduring friendships and life and career mentors. And Stanford surgery gave me my wife, my life, and my, my family. We are now embarking on a new journey. As mentioned, uh, I, Lourdes and I are headed to the University of Toronto and the Hospital for Sick Children. This is an opportunity of a lifetime for us. And uh, you know we're moving away from a lot of uh, very important people in our lives, uh, but uh, this is really something that I just cannot turn down. So. With that, uh, I will finish. Uh, I thank you very much, Electron, for inviting me to, to speak uh, to the department and to potential future uh, trainees here at Stanford. Um, uh, this is an amazing place. I'm so happy to be back here uh, and uh, to meet with some of the folks here and to, and to see firsthand uh, some of the amazing things that are going on here at Stanford. So thank you very much.